Marvellous. Thanks. So this is the first time I've done this talk, um, so you're kind of guinea pigs. And I always like to say at the start of these things, if there's anything you're not understanding, that's my fault for not explaining it well enough, not your fault for not understanding. So don't just sit there looking quizzical. Do feel free to just put your hand on and go shut it. I don't get what you're talking about at all. That's absolutely fine. Um, can I just check, first of all, does anyone kind of know about servant leadership? Does anyone know what servant leadership is at all? What would you say, those that say sort of nod, what would you say it might be? How to build servants. Sorry? How to build pyramids. Yeah. Awesome. How do you lead oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Totally. How do you lead as people who are naturally servants, kind of thing? Interesting. Any other thoughts? Enable your team. Mm. To do yeah, stuff. To do their jobs like, well. Mm, mm. <laughs> Awesome, awesome. So what I'm going to do is there's 20 minutes basically of kind of a whistle-stop tour of servant leadership and some of the concepts of, in it and some of the reasons it's important. Um, and it's really interesting because I was doing a talk last night in the Bath Scrum user group about why people argue in Agile. And one of the things I said there is kind of initially be open about your biases, be open about who you are. So I kind of want to start by being open about my bias with this. I've just done a master's in what's called strategy change and leadership at Bristol Uni. And that's kind of where we did a lot of learning about leadership, all the different academic school so I'm actually quite academic when it comes to this sort of stuff and I was kind of going through that stuff and I found that actually there's a whole bunch of stuff on it on servant leadership it's a thing it's an academic school of thought and then when you see stuff on um, agile job ads scrum master job ads it says sort of servant leading the team and I kind of think people quite often just go well servant leadership's like a scrum master clearing blockers or it's a team not being sort of the, the, the team being cross-functional and saying I'm not I'm a tester I don't help out with this people sort of helping out with each other and it's actually loads more than that and it's really quite Quite profound and really quite interesting. So what I'm talking about tonight is kind of from the academic side of servant leadership and I'm not sure anyone's particularly worked through all of this in an agile context yet. Agile says servant leadership but I'm not sure anyone's really thought through the repercussions. So a lot of what I'm saying is kind of a, a challenge to that sort of stuff. Um, so yes, that's me, that's who I am, that's what I'm doing with this sort of stuff. Um, as I say, this is a whistle-stop tour and there will be, I think there's an awful lot more you can explore with it but this hopefully covers the basics. So first of all, management or leadership. Anyone got any idea what the difference is between management and leadership? Does anyone think there is a difference between management and leadership? Any thoughts? Is management telling people to do things and leadership is letting them do it themselves? Cool, yeah, potentially. I think leadership gives direction, management makes sure it happens. Yeah, that's kind of closer to what people quite often say is that, in fact, there's a lovely quote from a guy called John Cotter. Um, and this is one of the ones that's cited quite often. But management is about creating order and consistency in an organisation, whilst leadership is about creating change and movement. Um, and they're two fundamentally different things. I think that's kind of something I wanted to cover at the start when talking about servant leadership, that what we're talking about here is actually a role that creates change and movement, and it's kind of transformative in a way. Uh, management quite often is about maintaining order, making sure stuff gets done, making sure that once you've found the best way of doing something, that best way keeps on happening. Um, but I think there's a lot of confusion around this. Um, you get organisations where you get leadership teams made up of people whose job title is manager. And for me, it's just bizarre. How can you have a leadership team made of managers? It's two fundamentally, fundamentally different things. And the interesting thing for me, I've done a video on this actually in um, sort of Agile and Scrum, is that management isn't what one person does, it's what the team does. The team manages itself. So you don't need a manager managing the team. The team takes on that management responsibility. So actually what you're left with, if you want to have someone kind of doing the vision stuff, doing the direction stuff, doing the change stuff, is you need leadership. Um, so that kind of narrows it down to what we're talking about there. And this, in brief, is a brief history of leadership thinking in the last 110 years, um, kind of how it's evolved over time. Um, so just to run through it briefly, 1900 to 1930, it was all power, dominance and control, what's called great man theory. Um, and it was called great man, and that really bugs me, it should be called great person theory, but it was men, it was genuinely men were the, the leaders, the people in charge. And it was all about telling people what to do, it was about having this one great figure. Um, and I was chatting to a friend earlier this afternoon, and we were kind of talking like football is still kind of like that, you get the team manager who is that great person who transforms the team and um, makes, is in charge and is quite dictor dictatorial and so forth. Um, 1930s, it moved on to what's called trait-based theory. So basically, le leadership was kind of innate. Did you have the traits? Were you, were you that type of person that could be a leader? Again, something I really, really hate, because I think anyone can be a leader, but that's kind of the approach there. Um, 1940s, group approach. Um, that's where you started seeing leaders in relation to groups. I always threw some of this stuff, because it's just kind of background, really. 
Um, 1950s looked more at group effectiveness. People in the 1940s said, right, leadership actually involves groups. Leadership isn't about a person, it's about how a person relates to a group. And then in the 1950s, they went, yeah, but what does the group do? It's got to be an effective group. Um, 1960s, kind of still the group stuff. 1970s, leadership kind of moved from the group area to the organisational area, and servant leadership came in, which is what I'm talking about. So servant leadership's kind of been around about 40 years now. 1980s, 1990s, transformational leadership was a real thing. Leaders were seen to people be transforming things, but actually, what if something didn't need transforming? Um, and then 2000s, authentic leadership. And actually, authentic leadership is how I came to servant leadership. Authentic leadership is really nice. It's basically about just being yourself and not kind of changing who you are in a nutshell, um, for what other people think. And by being myself at work, I actually discovered that I'm actually a servant leader, which was kind of interesting, really. But yeah, 1970s is when the servant leadership stuff kind of started. Um, and it's not had a lot of work done on it recently. It kind of got quite big then, and some people are still kind of carrying that torch, but it's not been around, um, not had as much done on it as say authentic or transformation and charismatic leadership and so forth. And basically it comes from this guy, uh, Robert Greenleaf. He is the father of servant leadership and the idea of servant leadership. Um, and he said some really nice stuff. It was a really nice chat by the sound of it. Um, and he said basically good leaders must first become good servants. And there's a thing called the Greenleaf test. And this paragraph basically sums up servant leadership, um, both in terms of what it is and how you can tell when it's happening. Um, it's quite a big bit of text, but I'll read it out. The servant leader is servant first. It begins with the natural feeling that one wants to serve. Then conscious choice brings one to aspire to lead. The best test is, do those served grow as persons? Do they, whilst being served, become healthier, wiser, freer, more autonomous, more likely themselves to become servants? And what is the effect on the least privileged in society? Will they benefit or at least not be further deprived? So actually there's quite a lot going on there within servant leadership. It's far more than just kind of helping people out. It's kind of moving into the personal level. It's how you're developing that person as a human being, as a person, not just as a unit of work at work. Um, and it's talking about society. How you, is your work making society a better place rather than just um, you know, helping your organization make more profit or deliver things more quickly or deliver more value to the customer or whatever. And it's got stuff like freedom and wisdom and stuff. And all, it's all quite, it's all kind of hippie-ish in a way. It's all quite nice, but it's all quite, quite fluffy. Um, so yeah, Greenleaf was great and talked, kind of introduced all of this thought. Um, then a guy called Larry Spears kind of carried it on. Um, and I think he's still writing about this now. And he kind of pinned servant leadership down to 10 different things. Um, and there's a huge amount you could go into in each of these different bits. But I just kind of want to pick up on a few of them individually and kind of the importance of them, really. Um, so first of all was listening, um, and that's really, really interesting, I think. Servant leaders listen, um, and listening just sounds really obvious. Listening is kind of like, yeah, you hear what people are saying, but it's not. It's all about really, really listening to people and listening to them on different levels, rather than just hearing the words they're saying, kind of understanding the emotions that are coming behind the words. Don't forget, this is kind of a hippie, fluffy kind of thing that's going on with servant leadership. So actually, you're listening to how people are feeling about stuff, um, and you're allowing them to express that, and you're really doing what's called full body listening, where when you're, you know, if you're in a meeting and someone's talking and actually they're a bit dull and you kind of start writing a shopping list or you start doodling or I'm brilliant at thinking what I want for tea that night in meetings, it just happens. And then I get an obsession in my head because the meeting's so boring. I end up buying ridiculous stuff just to, I don't know, say this obsession I get from not really listening to people in meetings. And I hate myself for that. It's really, well, I massively hate myself, but it's, it's a thing I shouldn't do. You should be really full body listening. I mentor a social entrepreneur at the moment outside of work and, um, I really, really, really listen to him. I really make an effort for an hour of the session we have together, really listen to him. And I can say nothing for the entire meeting and be absolutely exhausted at the end of it because you're hearing every single word and kind of trying to get the sense of the emotion behind that and what's really going on with him, really, really listening to him, really understanding him. And that has a really powerful effect on people when you're genuinely understanding them. Not only are you kind of connecting with them, but you're kind of getting where they're coming from. You're doing that kind of thing where you can start to develop them as people. You're seeing them as people. And if servant leadership's about developing you as a person, then you kind of need to connect with that person rather than just connecting with them as someone who happens to be in the same office as you every day and you need to meet with them at a stand up every morning. But more than that, you don't really know who they are and you kind of don't get on. Really, really connecting, really, really listening. Um, another one that I think is really, really interesting is empathy. Um, being empathetic towards other people. And this, I think, is really, really difficult because, 
you know, Agile talks a lot about trust. You've got to trust people. And to kind of to have trust with people, you need to have empathy with them. You need to kind of understand them and be able to, to accept them for who they are. Um, and that's really difficult because sometimes people are just rubbish. People behave really badly towards you. People, I don't know, you just get all sorts of human conflict, all sorts of human tension. And it's really difficult to be empathetic towards someone you just don't like or someone who clearly doesn't like you. Um, and that, for me, is a really, really interesting challenge around servant leadership. There's a great expression I love, hate the game, not the player. Um, and if you start to understand that someone's behaviour always comes from good intentions, and it's possibly the situation in which you're in, the organisational situation that you're in, that's causing their good intentions to create bad behaviour, it actually helps you become empathetic. It helps you divorce yourself from that person's being annoying to actually really connecting with that person and go, well, why are they being annoying? No one turns up to work to be annoying. I don't think anyone for a minute would go, I'm going to get out of bed this morning, really going to annoy people. Just You don't do that. But for some reason, you do. You are annoying. I'm annoying to people, I'm sure. People annoy me. Um, and empathy is really, really interesting, sort of divorcing yourself from them being annoying and looking at their good intentions and sort of understanding where they're coming from with it and really connecting with them. Um, Healing, it's really hippie-ish. How do you heal people within servant leadership? Um, and that's on an emotional level too. This isn't just about kind of, I don't know, they've accidentally bashed their finger when you go and get them a plaster out of first aid. It's really kind of helping them be happy and there's a lot more reading around this sort of stuff, around the healing stuff, but it's kind of, I don't know, what have I got here on it? Yeah, there's a quote around, um, healing broken spirits. Um, if someone's got a broken spirit at work, if someone's kind of turning up to work and actually being a bit unhappy with their life, kind of a servant leader's job is to try and pick that up for them a bit, um, which is something way beyond what we normally do, especially in large corporate organisations with formal performance reviews and so forth. It's very, we divorce ourselves from those, from those kinds of emotions. Um, persuasion. Um, really, really obvious one, number five, um, going back to that history of leadership thinking, obviously servant leadership comes around persuasion, not around coercion. So if you're a servant leader and you want people to do things, you persuade them to do it, you explain the reason why, and you hear them when they reply to you and you have a conversation about it, you don't just tell them. It's fairly obvious stuff, but it's an important one to pick out. Um, stewardship, I really, really like. Um, the idea that actually when you're working for an organisation, you're holding that organisation in trust for future generations and you're holding it in trust for other people who might work there in the future. And you're holding it in trust for the good of society. And this raises really interesting questions, I think, when you get into servant leadership quite deeply around should you work for an organisation that doesn't do good? Um, and obviously your definition of what good is in society will be different from what my definition is and different from everyone else's definition. But, you know, could you work for an arms company if the arms company just killed lots of people? Could a servant leader work for an arms company? I suspect Greenleaf would say not. I think other people would say, well, arms companies actually do do good. They liberate nations, depending on your, on your view of it. Um, but yeah, it's a really moral thing. And there's a thing in servant leadership about helping people be moral themselves, take their own moral judgments and giving them that sort of agency around morality and so forth. So it gets really quite, quite deep and profound about who you work for, how you, the sort of work you take on, the sort of work you deliver. Um, and commitment to growth as well. So, oh no, yeah, commitment to growth. Um, and that's on a personal and... Um, personal and sort of professional level. So quite often we do the professional at work. If you're managing people, you might have a performance review with them. They might have a development plan. Every month you meet up and talk through their development plan and you tick off their development goals and then they add more goals in. And it's all very sterile and very boring. And kind of, if you're not really interested in the job, you make up a development plan because you need one, but you don't really want to develop in this job anyway. Um, Servant leadership is about developing people professionally and developing them personally, helping them feel freer and more wise and more capable and more able and more able to take moral decisions and so forth. Um, so it's really, really quite deep and profound. And I think it kind of comes down to this issue too, intimacy. Um, it's not mentioned so much in servant leadership literature, but I really think there's an important thing around intimacy in servant leadership, that you're actually kind of, connect, as I say, connecting with people on a genuine level. I have a great test. Um, that I found every single high performing team I've worked in does this and any bad team I've worked in doesn't do this. But can you tell other people that you work with you're going for a wee? Um, it's really, really simple. For every team I've worked in that's been great, people will happily just go, going for a wee and walk off and come back and that's fine. Um, 
And it's that level of intimacy. When I work on the radio station at Glastonbury every year, we take on, we have a crew, we all know each other really well, working together for years, but we always take on four or five people. And it's interesting to see how quickly those people start going, I'm going for a wee. And generally within a day they do, because we have this kind of culture where we're just open and genuinely connecting with each other. And you can't not connect with people when you're really hung over for a week in a field in Glastonbury and you're drinking together and you're partying together and you're doing live radio together. You just have to really, really connect. And for me, that's a great, the, the we test is a really, really good test of, of how, how, how connected you are with your teams and so forth. Um, I don't force people to do it, obviously, but you, do, you notice it spontaneously kind of happening, that you're really connecting. And the converse to that is when you get real kind of, I don't know, especially in disciplinary procedures and so forth in, in large organisations, you get real issues where people start using real business language. Um, there's a phrase I've heard in one place um, where people say, I'm not comfortable with that decision. A chair is comfortable. You are comfortable on a chair. You're not comfortable in a decision. You're unhappy with the decision. You hate the decision. You love the decision. Be a human being. Have that emotion and connect with each other and go, you know what, this really sucks. And someone else hears you and goes, I hear that you think it sucks. Great. How do we, how do we sort this out? Rather than, or saying, you know, I'm disappointed. You're not disappointed, you're annoyed. <laughs> why, are you, why are you saying you're disappointed? Like some things are disappointing. I'm disappointed I'm not richer than I am, but you know, it's not a major issue. Um, you know? So yeah, I hate that, that kind of business language. And again, for me, that's a real sign where you're not making that connection. You're not doing the servant leadership because you're not really speaking as human beings speak. You're speaking as kind of corporate people speak. You're, you're putting on this persona, this act that isn't, isn't really you. And if they indulge me for a minute, this is where it gets really hippie-ish. Um, I've never included in, in a talk I've done anything about religion because it just feels like one of those taboo areas that presenters don't start talking about. But it's interesting that I think actually servant leadership actually has a slightly religious element to it. And there's, there's kind of reasons for this. Um, the first one is that this is a quote from Jesus. How many presenters quote Jesus? Brilliant. <laughs> I'm pleased to get this in. Even the reference, Christ J. Um, <laughs> Um, but yeah, you, it's this from the Bible, so Mark 10, verses 42 to 43. You know that those who are regarded as the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and their high officials exercise authority over them. Not so with you. Instead, whoever wants to become great among you must be your servant. Jesus was talking about servant leadership, like, over 2,000 years ago. Um, he was kind of saying that, you know, if you want to lead, you need to serve others. You need to help others. You need to heal others. Kind of, you know... I, don't want to get into it too much but his kind of point was to help everyone have a happier life and be be better um he was a servant leader fundamentally and then you see it in buddhism too um this is a quote from pema chodron um who's brilliant by the way i can't remember pema chodron i really really like her um and she's talking about buddhism and she says there's no question that we want um to end our own suffering but the shift in Mahayana Buddhism is this. We want to end our personal suffering so we can help others put an end to theirs. We realise that what we do for ourselves benefits others and what we do for others benefits us. And Buddhism is all about the interconnection of people and how everything is fundamentally connected, everyone is fundamentally connected. But again, there you're seeing, kind of talking about servant leadership, that if you help others, that will make your life better. Um, and they're coming at it from a slightly different angle to what Jesus was talking about. But you're finding servant leadership mentioned in... in um, in Christianity, in Buddhism, I haven't checked Islam and Judaism and other religions too, but I'm kind of surprised if there wasn't something there with that. And when, what, what Robert Greenleaf's talking about is that the way he describes servant leadership is, is a feeling you have. It's almost like a vocation. It's something you kind of feel called to do. Um, and that, I think, is really challenging, actually, because if you say, you know, scrum masters in agile teams need to be servant leaders, what if they haven't got that vocation? What if they haven't got that feeling? What if they haven't got that desire? Can they really do the job? Should you start putting religious tests in for scrum masters. This all gets a bit nuts. This is just kind of my initial thinking on it. So I'll leave that one there. But it's kind of interesting to see that actually servant leadership is a really, it's about personal connection and it's potentially slightly, slightly spiritual too and moral. Um, so I want to talk about why this matters. You know, so what? There's a thing called servant leadership and that's what the thinking is and this is how some of it relates to agile. Um, and there's a whole bunch of reasons why this matters. Like I said, I've mentioned trust and I think um, servant leadership is really, really great for building trust. There's all sorts of models around how trust develops between people. There's one guy who's got a three-stage model of different, deep le di different levels of trust that get deeper and deeper with people. Um, and I think if you're really connecting with people, you're really being empathetic with them, sort of doing intimacy and so forth, um, then there's a trust there. There's a real trust that you can happily say to someone, I'm going for a wee, and they're not going to take the mickey out of you. You just trust them or whatever. Um, so that's great. But the other one, I think, is around organisational structures. So you've probably seen one of these, but this is um, 
kind of a typical pyramid of how organisational hierarchies work. So you've got the chief exec at the top, directors beneath them, heads of department, managers, frontline staff, and then customers at the bottom. And the bit that bugs me about this to some degree is the fact this is actually a medieval feudal pyramid. This is how the medieval feudal system ran. And we're still using it in organisations to this day as if that's somehow normal, even though we have a democracy and all that sort of stuff. We're still seeing the feudal system as, as the way we run a company. Um, but what's going on there, really, above the level of customer, is that each person's serving the person above them. Um, so the frontline staff want to impress the managers, the managers want to impress the heads of department, heads of departments are accountable to the directors, and the directors are all reporting back to the chief exec because they want to be chief exec someday. So actually, all the kind of action and energy in that organisation is moving upwards through the pyramid. It's kind of going, you know, people are serving the person above them, so eventually everyone is serving the chief exec. Um, and the problem with, me, uh, problem with that for me is this principle one of the Agile Manifesto, where it says, our highest priority is to satisfy the customer through early and continuous delivery of valuable software. And it's great, and you read that, and the principles of the Agile Manifesto, they're great. But our highest priority is to satisfy the customer. It's not to satisfy the chief exec, it's not to satisfy the managers. It's to satisfy the customer, it's all about the customer. So why on that one are customers right at the bottom? They kind of go there because the customers connect with the frontline staff. And okay, there might be instances where customers write directly to the chief exec and so forth. But fundamentally, if your highest priority is your customers, why are customers at the bottom? So if you want to make the customers the highest priority, what you should really do is flip the pyramid on its head and say the most important thing in this organization are the customers at the top. Um, kind of makes sense. And then the interesting thing you get there is that you kind of then have to have servant leadership. Because the, um, if people are sort of serving upwards, then the customers are being served by the frontline staff. That just makes sense. That's what frontline staff do. They serve customers. But then the managers have to be serving the frontline staff rather than the frontline staff serving the managers. Um, the heads of department have to serve the managers. Um, the directors have to serve the heads of department. And the chief exec has to serve everybody. So actually, you need servant leadership for the customers to be the highest priority if you look at it this way around. If you say customers are at the top, then everyone else, the energy is moving upwards still, but it's moving from the top of the organization down to the bottom, with everyone serving everyone. So you can't really do that without servant leadership, I don't think. But I kind of don't want to paint too rosy a picture. There are some problems with servant leadership. Um, and I don't think the problems theoretically, I mean, theoretically, it's a bit woolly. If you're kind of an empirical black or white binary person, then yeah, it's a bit of a fluffy hippie thing and it might kind of annoy you from that point of view. Um, but it's more of a problem in the way other people react to it. If you think about it, there's a lovely Douglas Adams quote um, that when I was writing this, it kind of came to mind and I had to find, um, where he said, basically, it's been nearly 2000 years after one man had been nailed to a tree for saying how great it would be to be nice to people for a change. You know, that's what they did to Jesus. If Jesus was the first servant leader, they nailed him to a tree for it. They, he did not make friends. Um, people got a bit annoyed with everything he was talking about. It didn't really, I mean, I suppose it did end well for him, depending on how you looked at it. But um, yeah, people reacted really badly to it. And servant leadership done in this way really makes people feel a bit uncomfortable sometimes. You have to be careful how you use it because if you try and be too intimate with people or you try and be too open and human with people and they spent 20 years in an organisation where you're taught to put on this persona, to play an act, to, to look after all the senior people and, and raise your profile and so forth um, and to say they're not comfortable and to say they're disappointed and stuff. And if you go up to them and go, that was rubbish, they really, uh, trust me, they really don't like it because um, I've done it a few times and people didn't like it. Um, so, yeah, it, it makes people uncomfortable. It's difficult servant leadership. Um, and it's also, I think there's a real sort of paradox in it. It's a lovely quote from um, Lao Tzu who says, a leader is best when they barely know that he, uh, when people barely know that he exists. Not so good when people obey and acclaim him. Worse when they despise him. So kind of talking about agile that hundreds of years ago, um, fail to honor people and they fail to honor you. But a good leader who talks little, when his work is done, his aims fulfilled, they will all say, we did this ourselves. And that's great, you know, servant leadership is about supporting other people, serving other people, helping them be better and freer and wiser and more moral and so forth. Um, but it's fundamentally about putting other people before yourself. So you're not raising your profile within an organization. You're not taking the work of your team and then going to the senior people and go, look at, me, look at what my team did. I hate my team. I've got this video actually about how there's no my in team. Of course, there's no I in team. It's, the team is not yours. The team is the team's. Um, it doesn't belong to you. Um, 
but yeah, people kind of take the work of their team, take the credit for it. Servant leaders don't do that. Servant leaders let the team take the credit. In fact, they, they will do stuff and give, and give it to the team to show people um, rather than taking the credit themselves. And the problem with that is that if you keep on doing that and you're still working in an organization that doesn't really get servant leadership, then quite often people will start going, well, what's the point of you? I don't see you deliver anything. I don't see what you're doing. Um, you get the situation that I would love to say is apocryphal, but sadly isn't. But people say, your team is fantastic, is fantastic, performing really, really well, but your performance, we don't know what you're doing. And you're like, oh, you just don't get the servant leadership. But, you know, it's really, really difficult that if you're putting the team first, you will start to kind of look rubbish in the traditional sense. So I think there's an onus here then on those who are being servant led um, would be my sort of conclusion from this that, you know, yes, do servant leadership if you feel that calling. But if you don't and you've got a servant leader, you need to look after them. You need to make sure that even though they're not taking the credit, you kind of are protecting them within the organization. No one's going, we're not seeing them delivering anything. Um, you know, the, the team did this themselves, as Lousy said. Um, there's, there's nothing coming from that person. Because once that impression starts to build, people will start to get rid of the servant leader and be like, well, they're not doing anything, let's get rid of them. And you lose your servant leader and you go back to the old way of doing things. So if you're being servant led, it's incumbent on you to kind of protect the servant leader and make sure they stay within the organization. The organization gets what's going on and gets how it works and so forth. Um, and that's really difficult. And kind of that's one of my missions now, really, is what I want to like to talk to more, pe more people about is, is how you actually understand servant leadership. What does it mean in an agile context? And how do you protect their, how do you find more servant leaders, those who have that vocation? And how do you protect them and make sure they carry on serving others without getting destroyed by the, the normal way we do business every single day, basically. Um, so that's it. That's my thoughts. I have an email address. I have a YouTube channel, which you can access that way. Loads of videos of me ranting at the camera, which is great. Um, and that's my Twitter handle as well. But yes, if you have any questions, awesome. Uh, if you don't have any questions, equally fine. But um, yeah, thank you.